So hi everyone, welcome to the Building Stable Trees with Machine Learning talk. Um, this part, I suspect I can quickly gloss about, um, since everyone here should be familiar with this, what are stable trees, bug fixes, device enablement, no new features, pretty straightforward. Uh, how does stuff get in stable? There are two main ways to get your patch into stable. One is to add a CC stable tag, which is how most people do it. This way Greg will later look at the patches. Uh, use the scripts, look at the patch, and uh, pick it up. Another way is to send a mail to the stable mailing list asking for the inclusion of a patch. This is really only useful if the stable tag was originally missed, and it's more for like a, it's more of the exception case. In both cases, it'll get to Greg, who will evaluate the patches and merge it into the uh, relevant stable trees if it is stable material. This leads us to this slide, which is uh, what exactly is a fix in the kernel world. You would say that a fix is a patch that fixes a bug in the kernel, but in reality a fix is a patch that was either tagged for stable or later someone asked it to be included into stable. So really fix is a subset of all fixes that go upstream. We don't want that. We want to take every single fix into the stable trees. We don't want to rely on authors of patches doing the right thing. We don't want to rely on committers doing the right thing because we see that it often doesn't work. We see a lot of mixed fixes that end up going uh, upstream but not in stable trees. This is a really big thing with all the recent security issues we've been seeing. A lot of um, fixes that go in the kernel have some security implication. So missing patches that should have been there may cause security issues in the future, and we wanted to avoid that. Stable tags are also uh, not the best way. I don't know of a better way, but they're not really a good way to get patches um, into stable trees. They have a few problems. The first is that some authors don't know whether they should add a tag or not to begin with. Uh, adding a tag might depend on the subsystem you send patches to. So for example, if you send patches to David Miller, he might ask you not to tag stuff for stable because he will do it himself. This leads to cases where people try and play it safe and not tag any patches for stable at all because they don't want to get yelled at. Uh, this causes a lot of people just send fixes without stable tag. Another problem is that when an author writes a patch that should be a stable material, it might not be stable material at that time. So for example, if you introduce the bug in the merge window and you're trying to fix it around RC7, it's not stable material, right? It fixes something in that current release. But what happens if the maintainer of the top system was on vacation, taking a break, and only saw your patch in the next merge window? At that point, it already became stable material. But the patch itself isn't annotated that way, and it might make it way upstream without stable tags. Um, it's also different people see fix differently. So some people who might see an issue and think, oh, I just saw it once, it's not really a big deal, maybe I shouldn't tag it for stable. So they end up not having a tag. But in reality, the kernel runs on so many machines that even bugs that happen once in a lifetime will still happen often enough. In uh, most of the big companies, cloud providers, stuff like that, people who have large infrastructure. So they will hit bugs that happen very, very rarely. So we might say, yeah, let's just start reviewing all the patches manually. Stable tags suck, but we have this great guy who can review all the patches. That's what he's getting paid for. Start looking at the whole kernel. This is very, very difficult. I had to do some of this when I started working on the machine learning stuff. So I reviewed a whole bunch of patches manually to figure out if they should go into stable trees or not. And I found it very difficult and very exhausting. By the time you read the commit log, you look at the patch, you look at the relevant code in a stable tree, and you have to do it for several stable trees, you get very exhausted. You have to become somewhat familiar with the subsystem you're trying to patch to understand if that patch makes any sense there at all. Trying to do all of this for the 14,000 commits that go into each release cycle, assuming it takes a minute and a half, which is really a good case scenario, means that this is a full-time job. This is eight hours a week, four weeks, uh, entire month, not entire month, entire two and a half months during that window. So basically, we have to dedicate one person working on this constantly, and the person will probably go insane after about a week trying to do this thing. 
So I figured, hey, let's automate. This was sort of my first try and trying to catch more of these commits. So I started looking at stuff like um, if a patch has the word fixed, then maybe it's a maybe it's a bug that shouldn't go into stable. So I started doing it that way, but then I started encountering a lot of issues because I found there's no single big identifier that says if a patch is a bug fix or not. There's no this magical formula I can use that'll tell me if I should take that fix into stable. Instead, I looking at a lot of different patches, I started recognizing different constructs in the patch. I started maybe several words in the commit message might indicate this is a bug fix. Maybe the way a code looks. So if a code checks for, oh, actually let's do examples. <laughs> so stuff like <coughs> words in the commit message, that might help us. Um, code constructs. So if you look at a patch and you see that the two lines it added was if some variable equals null, return. It's a good indicator stuff like that are stable material. Um, unbalanced locking is a nice example. If you see a patch that either introduces a lock or Remove or does an unlock, which is unbalanced. So if it has only like unlock, if it doesn't have, for example, spin unlock, this patch usually ends up being stable material because it means that somewhere in the code there is unbalanced locking case. Um, some authors stand writing more fixes than others. Folks like Dan Carpenter, who does S match, usually fixes bugs rather than introduce new features. Uh, a lot of people, um, stuff like the uh, sysbot, so if a patch has a CC, uh, sysbot or reported by a syscaller, stuff like that, it's a good indicator that it's a real bug that was triggered from user space and it's an actual uh, patch you want to uh, port back into stable. <coughs> uh, it's also the case that some people will review a fix and not review new features. A lot of subsystems has this division of which maintainer does what. So some subsystems have folks who will do more new features, some folks will review um, older features, so we want to look exactly who are the involved parties, who signed off, who reviewed, who tested, stuff like that. So I end up with this massive array of inputs. I have a lot of information I gather from each commit, and I'm not sure how I'm going to take that and represent it in a way that will help me identify fixes. So Julia suggested, hey, let's do a neural network. I had no clue what it means. Um, but effectively, I take all these inputs, uh, stuff that are the most common words people use in commit message, different code metrics, the complexity of the code, whether we added new um, exit points from the code, a lot of information about the code, some information about the authors, some information about the people involved in the process, you see, reviewed by, etc., and the files that we touched. Uh, for the files we touched, I found that sub -sub some subsystems are more in a maintenance mode, so some subsystems see more fixes, some subsystems see more new features. So if you identify which subsystem, subsystem it goes into, we have a better guess at whether something is a um, bug fix or not. So I did this for all the commits from 3.0 to 4.16, which ended up being this humongous set. And my true value was whether that commit is currently in a stable tree or not. So that's how I taught the neural network about what a bug fix is. This turned out to be a bit too much for my little laptop, so I loaned a virtual machine that actually has a reasonable GPU to do this on, and it still took a month to generate something that I could work with. Uh, it took a lot of, it took a pretty chunky GPU. Then I finished this and I ran it on a set. I found out that the results aren't always correct, so sometimes it would indicate that a um, commit is a bug fix. But I looked at it and I figured it's not, it does, it's not even close. And I tried to figure out what's wrong with my uh, process. There are a few issues here that, <coughs> uh, that make it hard to train what a uh, bug fix is or not. The first is that not all bug fixes are stable material. Going back to my example previously, if you fix something in RC7 that was broken in that merge window, this is a bug fix, but it's not stable material. And it's very hard to explain that to the neural network. It's very hard to say, hey, this is a bug fix, but we don't want that. Uh, so my training set was skewed. My training set didn't, all the patches that are fixes, but for, would fix something in that merge window, weren't included in the training set. <coughs> um, another thing is that not every fix got into the stable tree to begin with, due to the first three slides I presented here. 
Not all fixes are tagged for stable. Sometimes people miss them. So my training set was even worse because actual patches that should be in stable were not in stable in my training set. And it's also the case that different people see bugs differently. So some things I will see as a bug, people will say, hey, this is not a bug, don't even backport it. So a lot of it also depends on the personal opinions of different subsystem maintainers. So, so that also skews the training set a bit. So I've been running this for about the past two years. Uh, even depends on the time. Recently, it's been finding even more things. Um, it found about 12,000 commits for, for the various table trees overall. Um, I think Julia made pretty nice slides recently, which shows um, for different committers, how many of their commits end up going into stable. So if you look at the past, I mean, it's weird thinking that in 2012, only 20% of patches were actually fixes, given what we know about the statistic of a stable tree. So that means something is wrong here. And if we look at recent results, 2016 and on, we can see quite a few um, commit, uh, quite a few Committers have a significant percentage of patches going into stable trees, which seem to make more sense. I picked an easy case, the x86 subsystem, which is an interesting scenario here. It's a pretty mature subsystem. It sees mostly fixes, but sometimes it sees new features. So it's a good example here to show uh, how the x86 subsystem was affected. So the red chart is the percentage of commits from the subsystem that presents that is present in stable trees. The green line is the percent of commits that are signed off by Ingo that is tagged for stable. And we can sort of see it's been the same thing. Ingo, tag, Ingo tags only about 5% of his patches to stable, which sounds pretty low for x86. And the blue line is the percent of commits in stable that actually have a stable tag. So we can see that since about we started doing this work, um, we put less commits that are tagged to stable actually go to stable. More commits that are not, talk, not, not tagged for stable go into stable. This shows how the um, machine learning is working here. We can see that uh, looking at the red line, we can see this increase in commits that end up going in stable for, for that person, for Ingo. Now, just to show that it's not specific to Ingo, but it's, also, but it's specific for the subsystem, I have Thomas here. And we can see very similar number. Thomas also tags very few commits for stable, but we can see that as time goes on, we push more fixes into stable trees, uh, and more of the stuff that goes into stable trees has a stable tag. Now, this I'll give Julia the stage. Uh, just to conclude on these numbers, if anyone has questions about these numbers, I've done them actually for all committers and all subsystems. And so if you want to know what your statistics are, then sure, we can discuss that afterwards. Oh. Uh, there are actually people who, for whom these two lines are extremely close to each other. And so those are people who are really being very careful about what they pr propagate to stable. They're sending everything to stable that should be going to stable. And then there are other people who are more like this, where not very much is being tagged, but actually now more things are getting propagated. Okay. So um, the purpose of my talk is to, my part of the talk is to kind of explain or demystify the process behind what's going on. Um, I would start out by saying that I'm not an expert on machine learning, uh, so I'm just trying to express what I have learned about it recently. Um, I hope it will clarify things. I'm sure if you want more detail, you can find it in other places. Um, so first, I'm going to step back a little bit and say, if we're going back to this unfortunate human who was in the situation that Sasha described, uh, this person, poor person, has to look at all of these patches and try to figure out which ones of them should go to stable. Um, so the person might have in mind some criteria. Uh, like as Passa suge suggested, maybe bug or fix in the log message might be at least a hint that it should go to stable. It's not necessarily a definite going to stable. You could say 
fix the line width so that it doesn't go over 80 characters. That's something you would not want to go to stable, but at least it's a hint in the direction that it might be relevant. Um, another one is, do you know the person who wrote the patch? Are they like a serious person? Do they mostly do good work? We don't want to be sending bugs off to the stable kernels. Uh, as she suggested, things like locking issues Null tests, these are often bug fixes, so they might more likely want to go to the stable kernel. Another thing you might want to look at, does it add new functions? Okay, so this is kind of a negative criteria. If it's add, adding new functions, it's probably doing new things. Functions are big and complicated. It's probably not something that we want to go to stable. Um, so some of these features, you can think of a number of features. Some of them make them more likely for stable. Some of them make them less likely for stable. So here we have an example. Uh, here's a patch. We can look at this patch and we can try to decide whether or not it should go to stable. Uh, so we can look here. It says, has the word fix. So that seems good. Uh, we can look at the name of the person. Okay, so I've anonymized this patch, but we can see that it comes, this person has been organized enough to get an email address at kernel.org. So maybe there's kind of a well established kernel developer. Um, then we can look at the code, and most of this code change is involved with locking, so maybe that's kind of bug fix like uh, Locking doesn't really contribute anything to the functionality, so you only want to do locking if it's something that's going to ensure correctness in some way. And we see it doesn't add or remove any functions. So based on our criteria, this seems like a pretty good match for a stable kernel, and this is indeed a patch that has been propagated to stable kernels. Okay, so that was all kind of intuitive. We had some ideas, we looked at our patch, we thought about our patch, and we decided what to do. If we want to automate this, then we need to, are going to need to construct some kind of formula and get some kind of numbers, and then we'll have some kind of thresholds, and we'll say things that are above the threshold according to this formula are going to go off to stable, and the other ones are not. Uh, so if we want to have some formula, then what we're going to have is we're going to have our features, the features we identified, and then we'll give them a bunch of variables. And these variables are going to be the degree to which a given patch is going to satisfy that particular feature. Um, so for bug and fix, it's kind of a yes or no question, so it might just be either value one or value zero. A well-known developer, some people are more well-known, some people are less well-known, you might give it a 0 0.5, 0 0.7, and so on. Um, and then we also have these features, so these features are not all created equal. Um, perhaps being a well-known developer, it's kind of useful, but it's not that useful. Um, whereas having locking, that's a pretty strong indicator that it's a probably a bug fix. So we can give that a higher weight, we can give this low, a lower weight. Here I've put a minus one to indicate that it's a sort of counter indicator for being stable. And so we have our variables which are describing our particular patch, and we have our weights, which are describing the value of each of these features with respect to making our decision. And then we can make a formula. Uh, so I'm just multiplying the weights by the variables, adding everything up. Um, we can plug in some values for our particular patch. It definitely contains the word bug fix. It's a pretty well-known developer. Um, it's, uh, it ha does have locking, it does not have any new functions, and then we get a score, so our patch is going to give us 0 0.96, and we so can say, oh, that's a pretty big number, so we can send our patch off to stable kernels. Or more accurately, we can send our patch off to humans who are going to check whether this should really go to a stable kernel or not. Okay, but that's, I mean, it's kind of the idea, but in, in practice it's not very satisfactory because we don't really know if bug or fix should be have value 0 0.3 or if it should have zero value 0 0.28 or should have value 0 0.1 or what value sh it should actually have. Um, another issue is our well-known developer idea. Uh, well-known developers Maybe they're reliable, but they also do many different things. They might fix bugs, they might add new features. And so just having a well-known, being a well-known developer by itself doesn't really tell us anything at all. On the other hand, if we have a well-known developer and if that person is, has a fix in their commit message, then maybe we would have more confidence that this is actually doing a, f a bug fix that we would like to propagate to a stable kernel. Um, so what we need to do is we need to be able to optimize our weight assignments so we come out with exact perfect ones that are going to really indicate to us whether um, the patch is stable relevant or not. 
And it's also desirable to be able to combine this information in different ways and not just the simple formula that I showed. So for that, we can use a neural network. So this is the kind of neural network that um, Sasha has used, the feed-forward neural network. So the basic idea is it's just a random example uh, stolen from Wikipedia. Um, the basic idea of a neural network is it's just a way of representing a formula. The formula has some inputs. We see the inputs at the top. Um, and then it has some outputs. In our case, we have actually only one output. Our one output is going to be that number 0 0.96, which indicates to what degree uh, of confidence we have that this patch should go to stable. And what we have in between are a bunch of connections. And basically, information comes into the connection. The information gets weighted, and some result gets sent out. And so it just gets propagated through the neural network, just like I, my inputs were getting propagated through the formula that I wrote previously. Um, so that in itself is not very interesting. Um, the question then is, where do these weights come from? And that's the thing that we want to learn. That's the whole machine learning idea. It's going to learn what the weight should be. And then once we figured out how much being a, uh, a well-known maintainer is really worth, um, then we're going to be able to make an accurate prediction based on that information. So the basic idea is you have some training data. For your training data, um, you have some, the idea of training data is we have a whole bunch of inputs, and for each input we have an expected result. So we know for some patch, we know, for example, whether it has already been propagated to stable or whether it has not been propagated to stable. Um, and then we drop our inputs into our neural network, and it produces some outputs, and then we see if our outputs are similar to our inputs. So in this case, we can see that our outputs are, sorry, not the outputs are input, sorry, not the outputs, the output should be similar to the expected results. So we have our expected results here. We can see that in this case, they're actually not very good. Um, so the problem is going to be in this, the construction here. It seems we have inappropriate weights. Um, and so we need to adjust things in order to improve that. Um, so it's not good. So the idea is now we are thinking of our weights as variables. Okay, so it's a small shift of point of view because if you look back before I had the variables being the matching of the patches and the features and I had the weights as being constants. Now we think of the weights as variables. Those are the things we might change. We see what, we go, what results we get for a particular set of weights um, and that, that is a function. It's a function from the space of weights, all the different weights, in a, into an error value. So here we have a very high error. Um, if we move around a little bit in this function space, then we might move to a lower error or we might move to a higher error. Obviously, moving to a lower error seems like a better thing. Uh, so it's kind of a hill climbing sort of problem, which is the local optimization where at some place we decide would we like to go down the hill or would we like to go up the hill. Um, and so if we decide we like to go down the hill, then Going a little bit down the hill will move us to some other inputs, and then we can try again with our training set. And we just iterate this over and over again until you get to an error value, which is, in general, more acceptable. Um, so we can try this again on some other set of weights here, chosen in kind of reasonable way, because we want our machine learning process to converge in a reasonable amount of time. Um, and this time, maybe we have some results which are kind of closer to thing, things we expected, and so eventually we'll decide everything is good enough. We're going to use this model in order to um, actual run day to day on the patches that come in and decide whether they should go to stable kernels or not. Okay, so that's, that's the basic idea that's being used so far. Uh, so the question is, how can we improve on this? So this is some work that I've been doing with a student in um, Singapore Management University. Um, basically, the work that has gone on so far is to try to learn the weights, but maybe there's some other things that we should be learning. In particular, um, basically we had features, and we should give some weights to those features. Um, but then we can ask, are those really the right features? So is being a well-known developer really something we should be focusing on, or should, is this something we should just not pay any attention to at all? Are there some other things that we should be focusing on instead? 
Um, and then another issue entirely is reasoning about code. Um, a lot of uh, applications of machine learning are things like images or text. Uh, code is somehow something different. Um, so we had, uh, Sasa suggested some features like modifies locking. Um, I suggested adding new functions or not. These are very coarse grained sort of conceptual things, but maybe there's some other more fine grained features about the, f uh, the code that we should be taking into account. Uh, the problem is the more features that you add, the higher the cost of your learning process. Remember, we keep iterating and trying to get to the best values. Um, and so we have to somehow focus on the best features. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is um, an approach that allows you to somehow learn what the features are that you should focus on. Uh, so the idea is to use what's called a convolutional neural network. So this is something that has been used a lot in image processing. Um, now it's also used in natural language processing. And so the idea here is instead of taking high level features that have been identified based on intuition, <coughs> to somehow lower the level of features that can be taken into account, but then isolate the ones that are somehow the most important, the, one, the actual ones that actually make a contribution to the result. <coughs> so I'll give an example first in the image processing area. So here's our image. It's just a bunch of pixels of zeros and ones. And so the idea is we make some little filters. And the filters, what the filters are going to do is find small patterns of image within our big image space. So the idea is we're trying to identify an ostrich, for example, and someone has figured out that having a, a figure like uh, a little space like this somewhere in the figure is a high indicator of being an ostrich. Maybe if you have this, and you have this, and you have this, and I don't know what they have for the head like this, maybe that's, if you have all of those things, then it's probably an ostrich. You don't have to actually look at all the pixels and all the feathers and everything like that, just those things put together indicate ostrichness. Um, so basically we have this filter. This filter represents part, the part of the ostrich that we're inter interested in. We take our filter, we move it over our data, and at some point it, we find a pretty good match, and we say, okay, there's a pretty good chance of it being an ostrich. Okay, so this is kind of just the same idea we had before. Before we said, does it have some locking? And so now we say, does it have this filter here? But the idea, the, the change of perspective is that when you say, does it have some locking, that's some word, something that's uh, expressed in natural English text. We can't do very much with it. Um, what's interesting about this is we have numbers, and then we can apply our learning process to finding it, figuring out these numbers. Um, so actually, within the learning process, we don't have the preconceived notion that this is important. Um, over time, we can start out with a filter that looks like this, but then we can, we can learn the elements of our filter and realize that it's not this that's important, but it's actually finding this which is important to being an ostrich. Uh, so the idea is we can observe in our case, our image contains eight-ninths of the filter that we're looking for. It contains it somewhere. This is something called max pooling. Um, and Again, we take our data, we drop it in, we figure out what our filters are, and then we do the standard, uh, the feed-forward neural network kind of thing, and then we get out some result, and it's a good result, it's a bad result. If we don't like the result, we can adjust our weights, but now we can also adjust our filters, and we can, also, we can now search for different elements in the image. Okay, then the question is, uh, actually, we're not working on images, we're working on uh, we're working on commit messages, which are text, and we're working on diffs, which are code. Um, so we, it, it's useful to think about it, how we can apply this to text, because we have exactly text in the log message, and code is at least a sort of textual format. Um, for text, you might think of text as a one-dimensional thing and not as a matrix, because it's a sequence of words just coming one after the other, but each of these words has some meaning and so actually a uh, text is a sequence of these meanings. Okay, so I've represented the meanings as just the letters which are contained in the word, which is of course kind of silly, but it's kind of easy to represent on the screen. Um, and so now we actually do have a matrix. So the 
vertical dimension is the meaning of the word, the horizontal dimension is the number of words. Um, so now our filter is going to, basically it's taking a window on the set of words and we want to see do we find a certain pattern of words in the message? Or do we f actually, do we find a certain pattern of meanings in the message? So as I mentioned, in our particular case, we have the log message and we have the commitment code changes. Log message is purely natural language, and so we can just use existing techniques from natural language. Um, the code, on the other hand, is going to pose some problems here. Um, if you think about, if we just take the natural language idea and apply it directly to the code, perhaps it's not going to work out very well because we'll maybe start out, we'll, here we have a minus, we know that it's going to be some code that's removed, uh, but basically the idea is our filters are quite small, um, and as we move the filter across the code here, we're going to forget the minusness. And then we'll run into a plus, now we know something's added, and then we'll move our filter along and we forget the addition. Okay, so then you could think we could, we could put little minuses on all the different tokens, uh, so that would solve that problem, um, but still it doesn't have the right perspective on the code somehow. Uh, so then we can think about how actually should we represent code changes. Um, what's the important information? What, what things do we want to somehow put together with each other? Um, so you can think of the very minimal representation. Our change could be just replacing an equal sign by a less than. Okay, so that's actually quite an important piece of information. Most of the time when you want to replace the equals, if that's the only thing you're doing, that probably actually is a bug fix. So maybe in this case, that would be a good choice. Um, but we can have equals equals less than or equal to, that's the entire token, that gives a little more information, the exact operator that's changing. We can do what I would call, I call an atomic statement. Um, now we have a little bit more context, uh, if header, oh, a for header, an assignment statement, and so on. Um, it's sort of a nice compromise between just equals to less than, which has somehow no context. It could be used for many different things. And actually, this function is being replaced by this other function, where we tend to get lost with the filters. Um, or we could take, just go for complete statements, the in one entire if, another entire if. Oh, so these are just a bunch of different options that we could take. Um, this is the one that I decided to use. I think an if header is sort of a conceptual unit of meaning, and um, so that kind of gives some context for what changes, but n perhaps not too much context. Um, once we've decided what is the code that we want to represent, um, then we have, can ask how much of that code we actually want to put into the machine learning representation. If you're familiar with what's done in the natural language processing world. Often they do what's called um, dropping stop words, which means like uh, this is a test, maybe a and is, they're not very, even this, it's not very important. Some words are not very important to give the meaning of a sentence, some words are very important. Um, so we can think if it's probably very important, once we have the if, the less left parenthesis is not very important because it's always there after an if. Um, maybe this name is very important, but maybe it's somehow too important in the sense that it might be the only occurrence of this name in the entire kernel, and so we're not going to really be able to learn anything from it. We could just record that it's an identifier and so on. So we can look at the different words in the, mess in the code as at different levels of abstraction. Um, and decide how we want to represent this in the learning process in a way that it can actually learn something that is, see something and generalize it into some kind of rules that it can use in other situations. Um, also, in general, a bigger vocabulary is going to increase the training time, so we want to keep uh, the information that's important, but not too much information. Uh, so actually, I you keep quite a lot of information uh, one thing that we, uh, there's no functions here. Uh, one thing we found very important to keep track of was function names, um, but other variable names we mostly just sort of throw away. Um, and then once we figure out how to represent our data, then we need to figure out how to somehow put it all together to represent the structure of the code. There's many aspects of the structure of the code. There's the removed lines, the added lines, 
um, then they're collected together into hunks, and then for a different a given patch, there might be it might be touching different files, um, and so we use a bunch of different neural networks to keep track of these different levels. So our results. Um, so we took our approach and we compared it to Sasha's approach. So basically, we have taken Sasha's approach and sort of extended it with a refinement in order to learn uh, new uh, features, learn the set of features, and not just the set of weights. Um, so the question is, do we get a better result from doing more work? Um, we have a data set that we collected. It is 80,000 commits from uh, about over about six years. Uh, we, ha we wanted to have a balanced data set, uh, so we have about 40,000 stable commits, and then we took about 40,000 commits that had not been designated for stable. These commits are of similar size to the stable ones, so the machine learning is not just going to learn that really big commits should never go to stable and really small sh commits should always go to stable. Um, we evaluate them in two ways. We have precision in recall. Precision is the um, percentage of patches that the tool classifies as stable that are actually stable. Um, when we say you should do something, are we telling you to do the right thing? Uh, recall is the um, patches that should be, that are actually being identified, should be stable, that are actually being identified as stable. Uh, so, and we compared this to, we compared three s approaches. One of them is just finding bug and fix. You can see these bars are quite low, so that didn't work out terribly well. People uh, use especially the word fix for other things, but lots of people express themselves in a different way, and so they have a bug fix, but they don't use either the word bug or the word fix. Uh, a result that I think is quite interesting is that we both have the same precision. Um, a precision of 100% would be a bad result because it would mean that we're not contribute that we have no potential to contribute anything other than what people have done already because our data set, our training set is only from um, what was done already. Um, so at least there's at least potential in here for things that our tool is saying should be stable and actually should be stable but weren't marked in that way. And our approach gives a greater recall than the Sasha's approach. Um, but there's still some potential for improvement here, and still we're still thinking about what more we can do. Um, future work, there's other problems in kernel development that maybe we could think about applying machine learning to. Um, first, we could, uh, is, is there more information? Is there different ways we could represent the code? Could we use a different kind of neural network to remember more information or manage the information in a different way? Uh, can we understand what the neural network has learned and try to either improve our understanding or improve the machine learning approach based on that information? Um, can we use machine learning to choose target stable versions? Or can we actually, the best thing would be just to identify the bug introducing patches, and then we don't have to bother with these stable versions anymore in the future. So, more work to come. Thank you. So, questions? I think you were first. So I use one, <coughs> one input, a one hidden layer, the same amount of neurons as the input, and one neuron on the output. Uh, yeah, uh, gosh. The question is, uh, one of the things that occurred to me where you are presenting is that usually most of the bug fixes are patches that apply against the previ previous version. Did you try to use that as a feedback to the narrow network or consider it some harm? I haven't looked into that, but I can think of a lot of examples where it's not. I mean, yeah, it, I mean, it's uh, not a rule, but it is a strong indication. I mean, if I have one bug on this version and uh, someone writes a fix, it will likely be applied, but at least at the version plus uh, minus one. Fair enough. Worth looking into. No?
So uh, I, I don't have a question, but just some thoughts about the non-developer. Uh, as maintainer, one of the common complaints is that, oh, you are applying double standards. You, it's easier for the old guys club to get patches merged than the newcomers because you have biased opinions. So I would just be careful on, the, on how you implement this. And maybe a suggestion is not use the non-developers because non-developers also introduce bugs. Uh, but maybe use the, because the fixes tag points to a patch that introduced the bug. And maybe count by the authors that introduced bugs and uh, somehow. And so the way I wanted to use this is not to sort of classify people as good or bad. <laughs> yeah. But more, to, <laughs> but more to classify people who are more likely to submit a fix. So if someone yeah. has, for every 10 fixes, nine of them go to stable tree in the past, then his 11th patch is more likely to be a stable fix than someone who does the opposite. So it's more of just figuring out who does more stable work and who does less stable work and classifying people by that, not by yeah. how good their coding <laughs> skills are. Yeah, so I mean, well-known developer was one of my criteria, but I didn't mean to suggest that that was being used in that way. I um, know, you know. I, yeah. I just <laughs> wanted to give some kind of yeah. features that one could think about. Uh, so the goal is to, uh, or the most immediate goal is to get more patches into stable kernels that should be there. Um, so I, we looked in the begin. I looked in the beginning, and the propagation to stable kernels it's like this. Um, some people are very low, and some people are very high. Uh, and so it seems perhaps unlikely that. I mean, uh, obviously, it's not the case that across the entire kernel, 20% of all patches should go to stable. As uh, Sasha pointed out, some, some subsystems are more in development, some are more in consolidation. Um, but still, it seemed something, this disparity uh, suggested it would be something to look into. So happens once in boot in your home computer different than happening thousands in a massive data center. I think we don't have a good way to judge how many people use a particular function. How Even many if it happens it. once per boot on thousands of VMs, including what, uh, you know, a page, maybe. So it, dep it depends on how far and you want to go. And that's and what happens. It depends. So the stable charter says that if you fix a bug, it goes into stable tree. It doesn't say how severe the bug is. It just says a bug that was discovered should be unstable, or an actual bug. So for memory leak, even if one page is actually an actual bug, so it supposedly fits the stable charter. 
May I? Yeah. Uh, okay, I have a couple of questions. So could you go one slide back, please? Yeah, okay, so uh, do I understand correctly that you took 80K commits from that range and you used it as a training set or testing set? Or ha so I think it's tenfold cross-validation. Yeah, uh, okay, okay. Uh, did you try, because I saw that Sasha sent a couple of these big patch sets with AutoCell, uh, did you get um, feedback from maintainers? So, okay, so the question is, uh, do you know what's the real false positive on current kernels? So did you get a feedback from maintainers saying, okay, this commit is false positive because it doesn't, it does not belong to, to stable tree because something. So I don't know. Did okay, you? So for our results, we've only looked at it from sort of a theoretical point of view, but Sasha. So it's really hard to get maintainers to look at this. That's why I spam everyone. <laughs> and maybe it's a good thing, maybe it's a bad thing, but I don't think that the results I have are valid in any context. I can measure how many patches I proposed, but then got dropped later because of maintainer comments. But I don't think that given the interaction level I had with maintainers, it's relevant. Okay, thanks. And just last question. Uh, this is maybe more practical to the future because uh, the system is evolving all the time because maintainers are taught to be better in tagging uh, patches for, for stable. So it would be, in the future, it would be nice to retrain all the time, so to do something like online retraining. But it's not that straightforward in this case because uh, you don't want, you don't have the real true value. It's the true value is what, what goes to, to stable tree and there are false positives and false negatives. So it's not that straightforward. So if you would retrain with what you, what you get, you, you would get a bias uh, with false positives. So do you know how to, how to deal with that? There's no good story yet. I do retrain um, again, but as I said, it creates a bias. I'm not sure if it helps or not. Yeah, okay, thanks. So we're about out of time. Um, want to say and chat and the speakers are willing to answer questions, go for it. I just want to warn people that um, if you actually wanted to go to another session, now would be a good time. So, yeah. so I'll be here, from Julia, yeah. if you guys have any questions.